Greetings all. Thank you for joining us today for a session on overview of radar and system, uh, synthetic aperture radar presented by IEEE Comsoc Bangalore chapter in association with IEEE APM 20 joint chapter and IEEE Bangalore section. Uh, we have amidst us uh, two distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Alok Nathde and Do Dr. Tapan Mishra. Uh, the session would start with Dr. Day sharing his first test with the radar systems, sharing insights uh, from his experience as an Eng engineer in Bharat Electronics. Dr. A a Day is chair IEEE Comsoc Bangalore and also is associated with Samsung India in the capacity of CTO. With this brief intro, I hand over the virtual podium to Dr. Day for his opening remarks, followed by his talk. Sir, over to you. So thank you very much. Uh, let me set the slide deck also, and then uh, we can start. Let me keep this in the front, but uh, start by saying, okay, welcome everyone to this session. And uh, this is this year's last session that we are hosting and IEEE Comsoc Bangalore has been uh, leading many events throughout this year and previous years, like this year, how this 5G, you know, taking from 5G to beyond 5G to the 6G technologies, how AI can be part of the communications in all the layers, the network architecture, how do you bring open source, how do you file patents and publications, research methodology. Uh, we did a 5G tutorial for students over 10 hours by one of the experts from our Exicom. And then this summer we did a Beyond 5G IoT, Human Machine Interactions Summer School uh, for Global Comsoc. There are 125 registrants from 20 plus countries. So I think uh, many of these works are encouraging young researchers to join us and uh, industry is uh, thriving in Bangalore region. So therefore we are able to also leverage academia and industry. This has been recognized by Global Comsoc for the last three years in the APEC region, Asia Pacific region. Our chapter has been given the best chapter award. And this year we have been very fortunate to have chapter of the year award across 200 plus global uh, chapters associated with Comsoc. So thanks again to all the founding members, the leaders, the Exicom, the volunteers who have been doing uh, seamless support to take it to this level. And beyond 5G, we also talked about other technologies that are coming on Wi-Fi, on blockchain, on reflecting surfaces. Today's sessions, uh, do you know, we also invited Bangalore section the chair is traveling to Mysore, otherwise you would have loved to join. He might still join. Uh, Mr. Vindu Madhav might join sometime. And uh, we are also doing this with antenna propagation, uh, microwave, uh, MTT, joint chapter that we have uh, jointly hosted. So uh, why we are talking this today, uh, we are having this distinguished speaker Dr. Tapan Misra, and uh, we wanted to hear him on his throughout the year that he has been working in throughout the career on synthetic aperture radar. This is the prime talk, but I also thought, you know, this is an interesting time as we are closing the year. Let me also join him for multiple reasons. First of all, we studied uh, 11, 12 together in the West Bengal board, Ramakrishna mission. So it's uh, kind of good get together. We also joined IIT together, but then he decided to go to Jadapur. Uh, he secured Bengal J first rank. So today, one of my goal has been to accompany him. The other things is, you know, uh, 
what he has been doing on 35 years of his career, you know, uh, that's going to be summed up. So I leave all the special topics to him. But my journey has been 35 years back, you know, similar time frame when I joined with Valet Electronics. So I thought it is a good time to maybe uh, recapitulate. Uh, Tapan has taken his superannuation this year early and we all, the batches would be either this year or next year, we all would be having this uh, retirement, quote unquote, to start a second innings. But I thought it will be a good time to uh, look back and see what we did and how things have changed since then. So this is a lighthearted talk for 20 minutes or so, a prelude to his talk. As you see this, uh, let me go to the next slide. Yes. So you see some picture mm -hmm. of Bharat Electronics. You know, today's um, logo that you can see, but the logo was very different when we worked. That was BEL, Bharat Electronics Limited. It was still a dream company. Today, when we talk about mm -hmm. young engineers as they join, so this talk is again about, you know, if you are having a uh, you know, you are the fourth year student and looking for your dream jobs and how you start your career. Topics may have changed, but then that's the same perspective. People's mind with looking forward to build something new, something interesting and the ambition that stays there. So this is the headquarter in Bangalore, as you see on the left side, many of you, those who are in Bangalore, they see this nice uh, building. That's the headquarter, but then you have a big campus in Jalahalli, and the right side that you see is the Saibabad campus, Ghaziabad, and that's where I worked, and this is under Ministry of Defense, this particular unit in particular. And so all the projects that we did between 2085, 1985, and 87, the two year stint that I had, it's all about the radar and the communication systems for defense. We studied, you know, in IIT Kharagpur, uh, we were fortunate to have communication systems as a specialty, only IIT Kharagpur and IAC. These are the two institutes which hold communication as a special branch. Every other institutes were looking into electrical engineering and make communication as part of it. So, uh, that's our uh, first thing, but we also had a radar center in IIT Kharagpur. So I got some exposures and some excitement was there during the fourth and fifth year courses to look into it. So when Bharat Electronics came in November, I remember July, we will be graduating and the previous year, November, this was the first company and it was the first person to receive a job. Obviously, a couple of people together, but I was the first in the interview queue. And it was dream because that time, BL, ITI, if you were electrical, you used to go to VHL, that kind of job. MNC just started coming, 1986, 7, I think they started coming and things started to change, but till then, these were the things. And today it is still a Navaratna company and uh, lot has progressed in this uh, particular company. With this, if I go to the next slide, this is our first project. You know, after three months of work and uh, tutorials and the trainings that company provides, it was a beautiful training, uh, you know, 30 people, three months together to learn various technologies. On the left side, this is the assignment I got, you know, Indra One Radar. So till then, the you know, company was looking into building, um, you know, adopting from other countries radar system. This was the first project that how do you make an indigenous radar, and not the same product, but look into low flying target detection radar. This was their objective, and some of us joined the transmitter group, some in the receiver, some other integration systems. Since then, I think uh, DRDO, which is the defense establishment, those who are working, it's, uh, you know, you all know, but those who are new into the field, for them, 
since then they have been working on various radar systems. But when I look back two years back when I visited even BL office once more to give a uh, keynote talk, I understood that uh, nine major uh, radar systems that they built over time for armed forces indigenously. And BL has been partner with DRDO, in particular LRD, Electronics Research and Development Engineering. So BL to LRD and then finally giving it to DRDO. This is what was our structure. By the way, radar, if you don't know the full form, this is radar, is the radio, the, the detections and ranging. That's what um, it stands for. So what you see on the left side is the Indra 1, but on the right side, you could see the Indra 2. This is 2006 in Republic Day Parade. The Indra 2 came out with a modified version. And these have been deployed in the border areas for low flying target detection data. Characteristically, you know, if I could say it's a tactical surveillance radar for point and area kind of detections. And for very low altitude, first high power radar systems. So today we are talking about Atmanirbhar Bharat, but I think even then what we did is kind of with the similar feeling that can we adopt whatever, you know, the previous systems, could we pick up certain threads and build a system. This was in two wheeled vehicle. The Indra 2 came out on three wheeled vehicles and the pulse compressions to optimize some of these power as well as to increase the range resolutions. You know, obviously we are looking at attenuated, time shifted, noisy signal conditions, how to improve SNR with correlations and matched filter that you know. This is what we kind of built, but both of these systems have been 2D radar, uh, you know, range and azimuth, so it is about detections. But subsequently, uh, India has moved forward to have battlefield surveillance radar, not only to detect, but also track, classify very uh, variety of targets. Uh, the first one, Rohini, uh, the Indra one is for Army, whereas the right side one for the Air Force. Then I think from 2D, Air Force adopted and went into 3D. Rohi, it's a ground based, but still mechanical scanning. Then came Revati, you know, that's for the Indian Navy. And since then, I think weapon locating radar and a lot of low level lightweight radar, these are too huge if you have to do portability, you know, it takes time. And sometimes in the border areas, you have to quickly cover with an optimal number of radars. So low level lightweight radar also came up. That's the journey of this series of radars. Now, when you look into as a problem statement, how is it different? You know, we talk about communication system, a transmitter, and a receiver, as you can see on the left side, right? And you have a tower, you talk to a base station, today's mobile talks to the base station, goes into another mobile, and you have a transmitter and a receiver. But the radar is about, you know, the same body, it's uh, through this radio wave propagating and receiving back, and you are able to detect the target, right? So the communication and receptions are together, and uh, with the duplexers, uh, you could be able to distinguish the different frequencies and separate them out. Now, as you see it, you know, over time, the interesting part, that was the starting, what I mentioned, but how is it evolving? So people have been talking communication, people have been talking radar, but then they started looking, as you can see on the paper on the right side, there are interferences between receiver transmitter of communications or with the radar target, there could be also communication because now the number of devices are growing, people communicating, it's no more less number of people, all kinds of communication. So the interference has grown and therefore the question comes, 
you know, how do you remove that? It's not just noise, but all kinds of your same channel adjacent channel interferences and you covered that. Then I think subsequently this paper as it's talking. So what is the coexistence method? And then can you cooperate knowing that one is present there given something is there? Can you cooperate into the other and optimize it? And then the third step is co-design. Assume that communications and radar or these kinds of communication will all be there. Therefore, not try to solve the problem at a later point, but design in such a way that they will be healthy. So this is a progress that has been going on. And the paper that I refer here is 2019, and that's the directions people are going. So yes, there is a difference between radar and communication, but also their convergence, coexistence, cooperation, co-design is being thought about. Then the one point that comes up is what frequency do you operate, right? And many of you are very familiar, maybe the table is in your head, but some of the people don't fully understand the differences of these frequencies and where we operate. So when you look into the, our radar, you know, Indra 1, that's on the L band. We designed in the L band. And today when I'm talking about 5G communication systems, you can see that, you know, there are two frequency bands in which range in which we are working. One is sub 6 gigahertz, so you can see where it falls. But also we are talking about millimeter wave in 5G, which is 26 gigahertz to 28, 29. That's a frequency band. So you can see that uh, the ranges. And it's very commonly known, but again, if you are new to the subject, you know, you see that as frequencies go up, the wavelength reduces because the simple equations, right? C equal to your frequency times wavelength. And you could see that, you know, as the wavelength grows, your antenna size would also grow. So lower the frequency, you have your, uh, you know, the higher the antenna size, but as the frequencies are going up, you know, the antenna size is also becoming small compared to that wavelength. And there are different designs that are happening. Now, just to give in, again, going back to the Indra one that we did, you know, we had a pulse width about 3.2 microseconds vis-a-vis -vis Indra two that came was about 6.6 .6 microsecond, if I correctly remember. I remember working on the peak power of 40 kilowatts. Subsequently, it became 100 kilowatts in the next one. The range that we are looking for was 50 kilometers vis-a-vis -vis the other one is about 80 to 100 kilometers. A beam width would be about three degrees that the beam that goes and you can have your target detections. And then this antenna was mechanically rotating at a 16 RPM. The right side, you can see, you know, the different frequency band and different applications that you can have. And as I said, the antenna size changes, but then as you go up the higher frequencies, your attenuation, the atmospheric losses also increase. Now I come to an interesting uh, thing that we liked that time and I didn't know what it is. You know, we walked in and suddenly these beautiful domes that were there. And as young engineer, we're trying to understand what is this? You know, I understand satellite antennas and they look different. And as you can see on the left side, you know, the antennas are very much there, right? Inside. Uh, but this is called radome. And this radome is about to protect from weather because there is a lot of electronic circuitry inside. And so the whole idea is how to enclose this uh, satellite of the communication antenna with a nice looking uh, fibered uh, structure. And this is uh, interesting because, you know, you have to make sure that this is a material that is light. It's going to be protecting against thunderstorm and weather. Uh, the electronic circuitries would be inside, but would be accessible. 
So it's cost effective, versatile, robust things. But definitely anything you bring, uh, you know, one is to design the materials in such a way that light weight, but also the radome loss would not be too much. And this is what I tell the young engineers, you know, what you learn in theory versus you go to your practice place, the, something is different, right? And this is what happened. One day we see in an equations on the actual material that there is this radome loss and that was not in the textbook, right? So you needed to figure it out what it is and then you discover such nice structure and you start to correlate and you see, okay, how the design has been happening aerodynamically, but also what factors do you need to bring in for insertion loss or scattering loss and things like that. So this was an interesting um, exposition at that point of time. On the other side, this is not so, uh, you know, exciting things for many, but, and we had this Teresa, you know, transformer design in electrical engineering uh, taught by some of the nice professors, and we used to count these terms, right? But this is something I also learned, and in fact, uh, even though I was stationed in Saibabad, but in that two years period, at least six months I spent in Bangalore testing with LRDE, but also working in the BL to design some of these transformers. It was very interesting because you know, you see in the book, but here you are designing something that you give this much input as a primary circuit, you know, on the left side, you have an iron core, as you can understand, and you give an AC input in your primary windings and you get a secondary coil AC outputs and the iron core is magnetized. And the magnetic, uh, you know, field is moving from the primary coil to the secondary coil. That's how you can do your step up voltage or step down, depending on what it is. So again, it's a different kind of problems that we solve, but still it is interesting because you needed to know what is your degrees of freedom in that design. You know, material, what material could you choose? Can you have different materials to change things? What is this wire that you can use and the wire density? Then the number of turns that you can do what kind of insulation materials you could use so that the dielectric breakdown doesn't happen, the thickness of those. So it's again very interesting because in an optimal sense, small transformer to a big transformer that we kept designing. And the ultimate was we started with small, but since I was working in the transmitter side, I was then said this 40 kilo KVA, um, you know, transformer in the distribution side, how do you design? So obviously that is not my work fully, but I got an expositions along with some of the senior colleagues to learn a bit more and to see not just those insulation materials, but oil immersions in this that you can see on the right side. This is of smaller size. That one is of even bigger size of 40 uh, kilovolt ampere. So that was again an interesting uh, journey. And then this is the other part of it. And I'm bringing many things that some of you may not have seen in life or will not see in life, but that's fine. At least one day you could look into it. The other thing that we had is this transmitter design is this klystrons and the traveling wave tubes. This is the, um, you know, uh, our kind of microwave tubes. And as you can see on the left side, you know, there is this cathode and anode and you have this electron that's going to be passing through. So we design RF circuitry, but then what happens is you have to amplify that power. You have to radiate in the transmitter side quite a lot to be able to receive a signal on the receiver side. You know, there would be a lot of path traversals and more you can do it, more range you could cover. So obviously, klystron tube was operating. You see the buncher cavity. So this magnifications and this amplification was happening in those spaces. Whereas, as you can see in the traveling wave tubes, the throughout the space you can actually magnify. So yes, scattered, and then sharpening of the beam, 
and anode focusing plates that are there, and then RF input comes. And this radio wave gets amplified by absorbing power from this beam of electrons and passes down the tube. Towards the end, it has a slow wave structure. And then you have the collector. At the middle of it, the helix is actually that magnetic force is getting starting to change into electrical force to take it forward. So this was again a very interesting uh, exposition that I have never had since then. This is, uh, you know, coming to the last two or three slides. This is the receiver side of the story, right? If you look into this, you have super heterodyne receiving structure. So obviously that RF signal that you saw, obviously it will traverse and once it goes there, you know, you have an RF filter and you have a local oscillator, right? And they could be tuned because as the RF filter frequency changes, this local oscillator frequency could also change so that the minus of them through the mixer going into IF filter uh, becomes constant so that it can pass through that intermediate frequency filter and you can have series of them scale up or scale down instead of going into one go you can uh, take it to a lower frequencies to take that forward. But the interesting thing is, how do you change that and this local oscillator and their tuning uh, in this super heterodyne receiver? So we talked about transmitter and this is a receiver structure. You know, there are many other points and I'm sure subsequent talk will cover and you have seen in the books, but crux of the matter is, at the end, your goal is to detect this radar, right? This R max equation that I put on the right is the range. And what does it depend on? So R max to the power four will be this whole thing. So it's one fourth. If you look into the R max, the range that we want to figure it out. So what does it depend on? It depends on the power transmitted, the PT. So more power you pump in, obviously you can go further. You have G, which is the antenna gain, so you can sharpen your beam. You, today, we talk about MIMO and many other massive MIMO that is coming. There is a lot of ways to increase the gain, but it may become much more directive. So gain increase means, yes, you can do that. You can increase your range. And the lambda transmit wavelength as it is lower, so either the frequency being smaller a lambda being larger would also help you to have effectively larger range of aperture that you have of the antenna, so you can have that. And also it depends on the target radar cross sections. If what you are trying to target, if it's a big object, then obviously your reflection points is much more and you have that cross section area is higher than if it is a very small object that you have to look into it. Then azimuth and other factors also come in, but this is a simple representation of the equation to appreciate what goes on. And on the other side in the bottom, as you can see, P min, this is the receiver's role, minimum detectable signal. So if you can increase power on transmitter, obviously you gain, but on the receiver side with a sensitivity, lower signal, if we can detect properly, Obviously, that means the range going up. So as I wrap up with uh, the two slides that I have is, you know, we talked about transmitter, we talked about uh, receiver, and this is a part of the system, but on my daily job, I was designing along with the team, many boards, circuitries. And uh, BL was known for its uh, capacitor, inductor, all these discrete components, but also not just discrete, some of these uh, digital circuitry starting from NAND to NOR to XOR to all of these circuits were also available in chip forms, which we studied in our IIT days, but uh, we could see and put some of these counter and design circuitry along with some of the experts. So I know when I was talking to Chengappa, you know, uh, other day, uh, 
when Chengappa was born, I have already designed maybe 10 circuits in 1986. And uh, when he started walking or eating, by that time I finished my 20 board co-design along with the team. So that's the time frame uh, that we are. And it was very interesting, you know, even the first design was no microprocessors. There was microcontrollers, but even 8086 in the first design, we could not, 8085, 86, we could not design. Subsequently, we did that, but that was the era that that was entering. So contrast that with the right side. And today we are talking about CPU, GPU, and tensor uh, processing units, the NPU that are there in the neural processing unit. It's a whole different uh, world altogether. And uh, we are talking about multi-core processings. And when we talked about 5G in the gaming, how do you include the GPU processors and ARM has its own, NVIDIA and many others that have built solutions and the newer chips are bringing either an ASIC form, like this is Google's ASIC TPU, but at the same time, you know, neural processing units. If you want to do a uh, deep learning, 23 layer convolutional CNN in for image detections today, that's what we are working today. And uh, we really look into those neural processing units for voice intelligence, for vision intelligence, different architecture, different nets that have come mobile net and others that's changing the world but uh, this is where we were and this is our journey in 30 years of the corporate uh, experience so to close this up this is one thing that i wanted to say that the radar we talked about that's for yes defense but we also see it for applications in the commercial space today and I, we are involved in design and the right side, this is Samsung smartphone in S21, we included ultra wideband radar inside. I mean, it's a communications at this point, but there are both functionalities that are available and it can work as car key. You know, your smartphone, if you search, you know, you'll be able to see how ultra wideband which came in between in 2000, 2005, there was an appearance of that, but the processing power was not sufficient. Even problem statement was not very clear, but today we are talking about how to detect human pet, multiple humans, count them and uh, use it as car key, but with radar principles. It's the same principles that we are adopting to do it. And left side, you know, even biomedical, health monitoring. If you see the signals on the top, the MRI, the magnetic resonance imaging picture through by which people detect today, you know, either respiratory signals or cardiac signals. If you do an MRI, you get that. But even with UWB, you can get this similar kind of appearance. So yes, some processing has to be done, but it has the potential to go into health medical and uh, consumer technology in smart home and many other uh, application. This is our new uh, incarnations with all this AI processing and the old technology knowledge uh, we are gearing towards and I'm kind of into the design of few and have few patents on this UWB related activities. So with that, I really thank you. And, uh, you know, this is the radar plots that we used to see in the rooms that you know if some operations are going on which direction the reader is and all the details this is a dashboard today we call data analytics and digital dashboards uh, that you see for uh, big systems but this was then and uh, still the monitoring and airport controls and other things obviously looks into that so with that i will pause here and uh, it has been a pleasure to talk to you and share some of my experience from the old days, but also how those fields are changing and how we have been adopting some of these techniques to come to the next level and modifying it from defense application to commercial applications. So thank you, thank you very much for your rapt attention.
and we will uh, take questions maybe at the end and I'm sure you are very eagerly waiting for listening to Dr. Mistra. So at this point, it will be my pleasure to invite him and uh, let me just <laughs> take off sharing. So um, great, so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tapan Mistra. He was born in Orisha and uh, you know, he, as I said, he has qualified for IIT J, but he decided to go to Jadapur University uh, with a Bengal J rank one. Uh, he was awarded JC Bose National Science Talent Search Scholarship in 1981. He graduated in electronics telecom engineering in 84 from Jadapur University. He started his career as digital software engineer and involved in microwave remote sensing payloads in SAC. SAC. He managed system engineering of multi frequency scanning microwave radiometer payload for IRSP4 during 95 and 99. He's widely known for his design development of C band synthetic aperture radar of the Resat 1 and uh, later Resat 2 series of high resolution X band SAR system. Subsequently, he worked with German Aerospace Agency for a a guest as a guest scientist. Later in the development of multi frequency scanning microwave radiometer instrument of OceanSat 1 and OceanSat 2. He conceptualized and led development of highly miniaturized dual frequency L and S band SAR, DF SAR for Chandrayaan 2 orbiter. He served as the deputy director of microwave remote sensing area of Space Application Center then became director in February 15 and then advisor uh, before his retirement this year in uh, January uh, 21. He received Vikram Sarabhai Research Award in 2004, ISRO Merit Award in 2008 for his contribution of development of SAR technology, elected as Fellow of India National Academy of Engineering in 2007. And, uh, has been also elected corresponding member of International Academy of Aero Astronautics in 2008, awarded DSC honor, honorary in 2016, and distinguished alumnus award in 17 by his alma mater, Jadapur University, and has been chairing many associations, groups, uh, councils. I have been also with him in the Siri Pilani uh, Research Council together and holds a couple of patents and a lot of research publications. With that, I would hand over to Dr. Misra. It has been a pleasure uh, to invite you and uh, I would love to learn along with others. Thank you. Thank you, Alok, for very generous introduction. And it is so nice to share the same platform with you. I think after so long year and uh, we were the neighbors in the same hostels, neighboring room. We are part of the same sort of mischiefs, which you still maintain with a mischievous smile. Probably I lost it. And it was a great journey together. And then also, I would just like to let the audience know that uh, we share the same position in West Bengal High Secondary Board Result in the, of the top 10. We both stood eight, so we have been together all the time and today also together here. Today, coming back to the presentation. You would have seen that the sports cameraman, you know, they they use a very big lenses. In fact, um, the sh bigger the lens, sharper the image. And you know, they're very related by the angular resolution is related by the lambda by L. L is the uh, diameter of the lens or the mirror. And you know, if I look on to, you have seen the cameras in the hands of the cameraman. But if you look at the space cameras, if I want to resolve from an one meter 
a resolution from a distance of thousand kilometer a simple relations okay the mirror of the order of a 0.6 meter is used they are very doable in fact all our carto set series and uh, gi set series cameras have mirrors of, of the order of 0 0.6 to 1.3 meter and they are very realizable but just imagine that uh, i replace the camera with a micro you know this micro lambda is a very large compared to cam optical wavelengths they typically between the 400 to 700 micron but in c band let us see lambda is wavelength is almost six centimeter and if you, the physics of resolution doesn't change you know what you will come back for the identical performance you need an, an antenna of the size of 60 kilometer it is just not realizable you can carry a 0.6 meter mirror you can carry a one meter mirror you can maybe carry to nowadays even a 12 meter mirror but carrying 60 kilometer mirror is just impossible that is where the synthetic aperture concept comes where that uh, to bypass this physical impossibility and you will be surprised that uh, Though it is a radar technology which has come, later on it has been used in even the radio meter. There is a passive sensing. In fact, today the high resolution telescopes are done to the radio telescopes. It's an array of radio telescopes. They use the principle of synthetic antenna, where the earth rotation position is used as a different position of synthetic antenna, and the finally the signals are synthesized over there. And they, you know, there's a Voyager, you know, which has already crossed the heliosphere. You know, it has a, it's still being tracked. It is also because of radio telescopes connected through the synthetic antenna. And you must have been, you know, two years back, you know, we got the first image of the event horizon telescope. It is nothing but an, an array of three telescopes three antennas which image this this uh, black hole in the terahertz band and earth rotation was used for us and synthesizing that antenna now let us see how do you do that just in that uh, front front as i will just tell you that uh, probably that uh, in india that the isro is the only institutions which builds are and then uh, luckily or unluckily for me, I have started my career with building SAR and ended my career also building with it. Though it is a quite a pride for us, you know, that uh, ISRO is the only institution to build SAR, but uh, somehow it doesn't speak well for engineering institutions because it's for some reason or another, or that we could not build that technology ecosystem for synthetic aperture radar and it cost us a lot it lot of you know that they, well, when you see the sonography mri pet scan ct scan they are some form or other of the synthetic aperture radar so we missed many research possibilities in radio telescopes because we lacked our knowledge of SAR and also for some reason or another, we could not spread across. Maybe the technology was too much hindering. You know, the trip, and Olok has, my friend, Dr. Olok has very nicely explained that uh, radar, but uh, concepts or what is his first experiences. I would like to say that uh, uh, nature has a radar. You know, that is the bats detect the targets through radar principle. They, they, they send out a chirp of sound waves. It is similar to the chirp signal and the returns are used for gazing the distance and the position of the target. This is exactly the same principle we use. You know, we send out a, a sequence of pulses or even the center continuous wavelengths 
and the return signal we collect and then from that the strength of the signal we can locate the target as well as the distance and it gives me my pleasure to say though the radar technology has been given you know the credit is given to uk scientist watson watt the grandson son of james watt who, the, who discovered that steam engine but they, I must say that the very first use of radar actually radar principle was used by Professor S. K. Mitra from Kolkata University to measure the height of D layer and the sporadic D layer. It was a multi frequency transmission and they measuring the phase difference and from the phase difference of the different frequencies, one could he could calculate the height of the D layer and sporadic D layer. And subsequently, this technology, this knowledge became the basis of FMCW, a radar, what is known today in a ubiquitous way. Now, I must tell you that when Olof joined a sophisticated radar company, I joined a space company of ISRO. And you know, that uh, as as is to be in ISRO those days, you know, the all glamorous job was reserved for glamorous people, and uh, for uh, non glamorous people like me, we were given a team. In that team, we had a responsibility of rectifying one defunct radar. It's a Marconi radar from in, donated by Navy and convert to into airborne radar. In fact, my first job was making the scrolling display of this radar. In fact, we used to call it a side looking airborne radar. And they, uh, the, what you see that images on the right side, the images we got it. And in fact, in those days, you know, the say ISRO people were getting accustomed to very sharp images obtained by IRS 1A, launched in 89. You know, it's a 23 meter resolution from an 840 kilometer height. And when we used to show these images, you know, captured from a two kilometer height and having 300 meter resolution, people used to laugh at it. But, but for us, it was an exhilarating understanding. Let me just give you a glimpse of uh, that the principal operation of imaging radar, or call it a side looking airborne radar. What essentially you see, this is uses as antenna, a rectangular antenna with a fan beam that is a broad, longer direction is aligned to the flight path, which is a narrower beam, and the smaller dimension is perpendicular to the flight path, having a so it is a wider beam and obviously you cannot carry in that aircraft a big antenna. This antenna seems to be small, one to four meter. It will transmit a pulse and the pulse returns will come. And you look, look at it. Different segment of that image, you know, will be From that across the flight direction, they will be imaged in the terms of distance, in the time distance for the pulses. And also you see the pulse footprints, you know, as you go further and further, it becomes narrower. That means the image is supposed to become sharper when you look further, unlike camera. Camera, when you look directly below, it looks sharpest and you look away, it becomes, oh, you know, hazier and hazier. That is our everyday experience with a mobile camera, but unlike this radar. But only disadvantage is as you go further and further, the resolution along the cross track direction actually becomes poorer and poorer. And let me tell you how poorer it is in an S band, which is a four meter resolution. Uh, it's a four meter antenna from a two kilometer height. The resolution can be as bad as 200 to 500 meters. It is pretty bad. Now this problem is solved 
by synthetic aperture principle we see later and then you know but in those days it was very exhilarating we used to fly on a dakota 9 and then you know that was a very very safe aircraft with a lot of holes inside and you need to be very careful to step in in a wrong hole because you'll be falling down straight below though these two covered with the wooden planks and many times the, the younger people who join a job you know they look for very glamorous job but i was fortunate to have been given an, a non-glamorous job of a repairing an antenna uh, repairing a radar along with the team obviously and making it a imaging radar it was a search radar which was converted into imaging radar you know the synthetic aperture radar actually you know, it was a quite old it is actually came the concept from 1952 i must tell you the story that uh, this gentleman jim kelly carl willie he was actually given a responsibility to finding a better homing methodology of missiles and he he was an instrumentation engineer he had no word link with the radar and he was a maverick in his thought and he came out with a synthetic aperture radar it is those days it is to be a doppler and un, unbeam search radar dowser and it used a 930 megahertz and in fact those days they used the vidicon tube as a storage device to synthesize this antenna and they and you will not see much paper by the Carl Willy because you know he was prevented by the patent laws, the secrecy laws of those days uh, to publish any paper. In fact, the modern day synthetic aperture radar came from Edward C. Jordan, you know, of the famous of the Jordan Bulman book, what you have read in the antenna a test in colleges. Let me give you a glimpse of how does it do it. You think of we carry a small antenna, which is a wider footprint, and we look at a target. What happens? We look at an isolated target. As you see that for different distance, the target appears at a different time. And if I store it in a two by two, a, a, an, a, a, an array, a matrix array of memory, the signal trajectories and histories they will look like. We assume that uh, there is some mechanism that uh, what we use this small antenna created a very large linear antenna. Imagine if I can introduce the phase correction co corresponding to this purple color of the distance that is a, you cal calculate the distance at different time that uh, from the center point and you multiply by four pi by lambda and give a negative to the space correction and you can add them up it becomes a spherical antenna with a focus at the target and you can that is how you get a much narrower beam you will be surprised that uh, when you image further, this array, the synthetic array length also becomes further longer. And uh, consequently, the beam becomes narrower and narrower. And, and the resultant uh, solution is that the ground resolution becomes independent of height or distance. You know, this is a fantastic derivation from the synthetic aperture radar. We'll start going into how we process it. It just uh, to give a such a better glance, as if we transmitted signal at the same pace. When you at that location, that is signals are coming with the different phases. And if we do a phase correction, they get aligned. And then if they sum them up, they get betterly sum up, the signal becomes stronger. And if you look at the noises, noises are not coherent. So they become less. Sorry. They become.
they become less and less pronounced and the signal comes out of the noise. We'll see that is, there is a synthetic aperture radar, you know, mechanism of processing. I'm not going to go with a very detailed mathematical, I think mathematics is secondary to this graphical representation. Let us look at its graphical representation. How does it happen? We have given introduction to this. We have put up an another pen, you know, along with the memory pen where the signal structures are there. We have another put up a Doppler frequency versus azimuth time. We have told that each target that goes to a carbolinear trajectory, we call it a range cell migration. This is a memory organized by the range time and the azimuth time. There is a different pulses, as I explained to that. And you see, when you want to add them up, if you don't want to use a 2D processor, you have to straighten that histories together and that will make them lie in one line and it can become a linear processor. Instead of a 2D processor, which is computation intensive, it can become a computation, uh, computationally beneficial linear processor. But you see that if I try to correct one, the other two targets will get distorted. That means you can process only one by one. But you know, there is a, you look at a, from a Doppler frequency point of view, each of the Doppler frequency of the different targets, they actually lie in a different range gate. And you know, and they, when you, you know, keep the range in a time, but in, in the azimuth direction, you take a Fourier transform, instead of it taking a 2D Fourier transform, they will, surprisingly, all the targets will coalesce. You know, I am telling it so simply, but uh, you must understand from 1952, it was discovered, this principle was done. And this idea that uh, one need not even take a, always a 2D Fourier transform of a signal, one can work with a partial transformation. It came all the way in 1982 by Fabio Roca in his PhD thesis in Stanford and not in a radar subject, but in a geology. It, it is for the sonar analysis it was done. And they, you know, this, this one simple conversion, you know, which awaited so many decades would change the SAR processing like anything. One can see that they, what essentially, you know, if I straighten the one single curve, which is actually multiple target, is equivalent to all the targets getting corrected in the time domain. And then subsequently, it is nothing but a, a convolving filter. You know, this all these antenna phase corrections and all, they, they could be applied and the convolving filter will correct it and focus the target on the image plane. And you know, that it's an astounding idea that a, one can do a partial tra Fourier transform provided the bandwidth in both the sides would be, the ratio will be very large. That means you can only operate only when the bandwidth in one dimension is much, much smaller than the bandwidth in other dimension. Just uh, what we can see that uh, mathematically, they will look like the raw data. We'll take an FFT in one direction. We call it a, this is straightening from a carbolinear path to frequency domain. We call it a, a rain cell migration correction and then a mass filter and then inverse Fourier transform and then we get an image. I can show you this, you know, how this a convolving filter moves and different target hysteresis processes and brings out images at a different point. You know, that, uh, what about that? Uh, in, uh, Actually, the data which is collected, you know, whenever you 
collect this our data, raw data, which is collected on board or in the aircraft or the satellite transmitted to the ground, they actually looks noisy. In fact, they are perfectly follows the central limit theorem and they become zero mean Gaussian signal. And it takes a number of processing to bring back this image of the fantastically. In fact, you know, my experience with this, this R processing is so exhilarating. If you make a small mistake in understanding the SAR process, the images, it, the images will tell you. And uh, it needs a lot of experience and understanding of the SAR to see from the images, to guess from the images where the mistake would have been. Because it is very difficult when you write a software where you made a mistake, small mistake, which has caused that image until unless you know the SAR thoroughly, it is very difficult to debug. Because most of the time, the debug, the software, the error comes from the understanding error. Until unless that is cleared, the software bug can never be removed. Now, it, it is the two. We, we showed, you know, that a synthetic array antenna, it is a straight line. If you want to use a fast Fourier transform based convolver, you know, that's a multiplication of frequency domain, there are two conditions. One, they should, the SAR, all the measurement antenna measurements should be done in a linear path and they should be equally spaced, irrespective of. But you know, they say, this is your, this is a utopian condition. More often than not, these are violated, especially for airborne synthetic aperture radar. They come, I'll just give you an example. Just look at the animation. Actually, the aircrafts do not fly in a straight line. In fact, the pilots, Play quite a truant in the image. But you see, when its image is there, it actually imaged a very not a perfect geometrical rectangular thing, but in a, some distorted weight images. And you look at the beam central line, you know, they are unevenly spaced and unevenly aligned. So, what we do the first step? We do the resample of that data, which are in the, is which are actually collected at the equal time, than to an equal spacing. That means say we call it the V by PRF is the spacing between the two consecutive samples. Now by measuring the along track velocity, we can resample the data so that the, they are sampled at an equal physical spacing. That is one condition of synthetic aperture radar processing we solved. The next condition is we have to make it appear as a straight line. What we measure, you know, that uh, from an onboard navigation system, we measure the actual position of the antenna and from an assumed linear track to actual debated track, we calculate the difference and reposition the data so that, you know, there is a two things have to be done. They have to be positioned with respect to a distance, range distance from the linear track. And then a correspondingly one phase correction has to be given because radar operates on the phase, so correct phase correction. When you do that in a, you know, that a memory space, they becomes curvilinear, but the whole processor is full as if that the aircraft has flown on a straight line at a constant velocity. And then it needs a processing and then it keeps on the TMS. This is her. In fact, you know, many people think that uh, you know air, airborne synthetic aperture radar in fact, is, are the much easier. But let me tell you that uh, spacecraft are very deterministic. They move in a, almost a constant velocity. But a uh, processing of an aircraft or a 
or a UAV bone synthetic aperture radar is almost 10 times more complex than a processing of a space bone. This is a given, you know, this, this sort of thing that uh, we call it a synth uh, SR, we have a motion compensation. And when you do with that motion, without a motion compensation, that is a range, velocity, this, all corrections, the image is blurred. When you do a proper motion compensation, you can see that the images become very, very sharp. There is another version. You, know, you will see that uh, this resolution of an image, uh, rudimentary, that is a, it is always L by 2. That is, if I use a 1 meter antenna, I will get a half a meter resolution. If I get a 12 meter antenna, I will get a 6 meter resolution. But if you want to bypass this process, how can I do it? That uh, I've not go to the very nitty gritty. We call it a spotlight star. In which case, we continuously steer this antenna. So that they would go on looking at the same target and finally achieve a much, much bigger antenna than possible by a normal strip map. Sir. But there is a penalty because you go on looking at a one particular spot continuously, you will miss imaging the adjoining areas beyond the spot. So you can image a spot by spot but you can synthesize a much longer synthetic antenna and, and consequently much sharper resolution. In fact, you know, we have used an um, RI set, a six meter antenna. So you could best resolution you can get is a three meter, but we could image even with a 0.6 meter using this technology, having this portrait SAR imaging. I'll not go into the nitty gritty of processing, you know, there is a, another very interesting thing that uh, this SAR can find out the height, you know, the cross track height. We call it a, a cross track interferometry. It measures the height of the terrain. You know, it is just, you know, it, you don't have to do with the two different views on, from opposite direction using the parallax to image. It's a typical studio imaging thing. What you can use the phase difference and to get this measurement through. And there are two types of measurements are there. One is that the cross track interferometry along the along track will just show through an animation. Let us see, I have a, I transmitted the antenna, two SARS which are tied together. Each one, trans both are synchronized. So if one, if that trans signal is transmitted at the same instant from both of them, when they travel to the target and come back, they are actually different distance. In fact, the phase difference between them will appear like this equation. And you know, if the height is smaller, the phase difference reduces. If height is larger, we'll go back and see. You see that uh, when the height is more, the phase difference is more. When the height is less, the phase difference will become small and they, uh, from the ground surface, or it will become same distance. It's almost a nil. There is another way, you know, let's say, if we, you, I use a single antenna, but I go on measuring the phase difference between the two antennas, which is slightly passed through a difference along the flight direction. The previous antennas, they were, they were differing in the, across the flight direction. Here, two SARS, they are differing along the flight direction. And they, in case, in this case, what happens, when they, because of a radial velocity change, the two SARS will image with a different phase. In fact, uh, we can measure the moving target indicator through this sort of SAR. In fact, uh, even that a uh, very slow moving waves, ice, 
they can also be imaged through this measurement. And one must understand that they, it may not be two SARS. It can be one transmitter antenna and they, another two receive antennas that will do the exactly the same job. And it also can be two satellites which are imaging at a different time and the orbits are slightly separated out but provided they are imaging in a close proximity of time. Then also you can make a interferometry and this SAR as an image, it gives you a, an idea of the surface topography. It's, it's, it's a fantastic device. We'll see one instrument what we are building together. This is a Mount Vesuvius. You can see that uh, obviously that uh, phases we can do becomes large and small, but the actual phases vary between a zero to two pi. So there will be always a fold over and the Mount Vesuvius will be there, you know, the, this direction, the slope is sharper. So you see a, a rapid change in uh, phase boundaries, but a slower change in phase boundaries in the other side, the slope is narrower. And this is where you see that the actual height calculated from this image. Let us look at a SAR technology. You know, that uh, my friend Dr. Alok showed a SAR, uh, a typical radar. Let me tell you that uh, what a radar is used is actually pulse Doppler radar. And a synthetic aperture radar is actually constructed after we receive the signal. In fact, the, the name synthetic comes because the image is never a real time. It is calculated. It is synthesized in a post facto. Only the delay may be few microseconds to few seconds to few hours. But the technology wise, if you see that the SAR systems, they have all the space bound SAR system, they have a one common characteristics. They are coherent, that is the same frequency source is used for up converting the chirp signal and down converting the chirp uh, receive signal so that the phase reference is maintained and they digitized also in the same phase. In fact, uh, the, all the heterodyne receivers down LOs and A2D converters and IQ demodulators all have to be in synchronism and in fact uh, that uh, first set of SARS you know that is a, a CSAT SAR or ERS1 SAR they had all this configuration they had a TWTA transmitter Olox, Dr. Olox showed it and they had a large passive antennas so only problem is a in a space that uh, TWTA or the clistrons they are susceptible to, you know, let's say, uh, corona discharge and accidental gas leaking and all those problems. And uh, many of the SAR systems failed. In fact, a CSAT SAR failed after three months because of power issues. ERS-1 failed because of TWT failure. But uh, as far as the imaging is concerned, it images one fixed position from a fixed direction and it has no flexibility. You know, as the radar technology improved, then came a phase direct radar. You know, instead of a carrying a big antenna, this is an antenna with a small elements of antenna, each fed with a phase shifter, and this provided an option of a, 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 electronically shifting. In fact, many of the new beams have a new imaging formation came from uh, white swatch SAR and all they came from capability of electronic steering of the beam. So that means uh, one can image a different thing. Then came they say TWTs, you know, having a high power uh, trans uh, equipment, high, high power TWTs or the high power Clistron, they have an inherent problem of failure. So, because the SAR systems are costly, that next 
is a active array radar that it has a phase shifter as well as a small small transmitter receiver embedded with a small section of a antenna if we call it a tr module this has a power so we, we use a small power source to transmit to all these antenna elements they in turn reamplify the signal transmit and the receive signals also collected by a number of array of low noise amplifiers they are summed up analog sum then are captured and brought to this is where rest of the SARS remains same. And uh, this opened this possibility that uh, it's a failure safe. That means uh, even if a few of TR models fails, the whole SAR doesn't fail and still SAR remains active for much, much longer life than what was designed. This is how that uh, uh, NBSAR, TerraSAR or RISAT was designed. And, uh, it and it has also the ability of a frequency of, of the electronically steering the beam at a different location and it gives you the imaging flexibility. Now the next series of antennas which are coming, you know, these are called the digital beam power. Here we use a high power transmitter with a small antenna and beam a larger area but we receive through number of small antennas and on board they are digitized each of the chain and then digitally they added together and this gives you additional steering capability along the flight direction that means as i showed in the spotlight sir we had to till the satellite now you don't have to till the satellite you can do digital beam format without tilting the satellite, you can collect the image. In fact, it paves the process way of having a very high resolution SAR without tilting and it need not be image to spot, it can be through a continuous imaging. In fact, one of my latest patent is on this field, on the digital beam format. We just tell you that the, we first built, you know, we are the fifth country in the country in the world to build the first synthetic aperture. So we actually tell you that uh, this experience was very, very difficult. In fact, uh, many times, even being in all very well-known engineers, well versed with the technology and subject, Sometimes we miss many, many small things in the technology and it cost us dearly. In fact, I still remember that the first airborne SAR, which you flew successfully on 20th May 1992, it was a C-band SAR with a six meter antenna and a six meter resolution with a one meter antenna. And if I must, you know, I unabashedly tell you we have burned this radar 52 times. And we learned it very hard way through that they, even in the pressurized aircraft, when you climb to 10,000 feet and above, the internal pressure actually reduces from atmospheric pressure to almost loses one fifth of the pressure. And that was causing corona discharge in the tube and uh, this is what caused us a hell of a problem. In fact, uh, today if I tell you this, it's a coronal discharge, you know, which all of us studied at a class 10 level, but uh, it would be surprising. We still couldn't understand that time. How can the pressure reduce? But actually when you, we built radar, but we have not understood the aircraft pressurization system, that the pressurization system doesn't maintain atmospheric pressure at a height. Now, especially the small aircrafts. And then we had to fortify it. We get images. Then we built an, another set of radar. And almost 10 years later, it is also in C-band, but with a resolution of, of the order of 0.6 meter. 
you can see the images what we built, you know, we, we received. You can even distinguish that uh, aircraft engines parked on the runway or even the small trees, bushes or the crops, even the height difference you can see through the shadows and all that. And this was a fantastic journey in understanding the synthetic aperture data. I still remember, you know, th this image is a Koshi bridge, I think 2008, August. And they, this is the Koshi river, it is in Nepal, it has bridged and it has actually flooded like a, you know, that's a more like a MRI scan of a stroke patient. What it flooded in the Bihar Madhepura region and there was a the Home Ministry wanted to have a very clear picture of how, how the breaches happen, whether it's a man-made or a, a natural breach, we can find out that the breach type, that is a, how sharp or how... Hmm. The, there, the uh, images, we imaged it from flying all over Bihar and imaged almost 100 kilometers away. And you, you'll be surprised, this is approximately mosaic of 600 images of six by six kilometer images, which were carried out. And you can see that how seamless the mosaic would be done. This is tells of the of strength of the SAR, what we built and the processor we built. And the high time of my career of building the Reset 1, it is an active barrier radar. And they, you can see that it's a 6 by 2 meter antenna. And you can see the different phases of its testing in a clean room in thermobac chamber. And we launched it in 2012, 26 May. One interesting thing we changed from other people that uh, we put dedicated H and B antennas and separate TR modules. It was a very, very interesting configuration. We'll show it. And this led us to, for the first time, to introduce hybrid polarimetry, all possible imaging modes. In fact, we made a change. The conventional polarimetry, the four polarization polarimetry needed twice the data. But this is the one polarimetry where the data signal is transmitted in circular polarization and received signal is received and digitized in a two linear polarization. And from this, the polarimetry is reconstructed and you can see that the fantastic set of images. I'm not going to explain all the details, but uh, this polarimetric variability tells you how different types of signature can be isolated. One interesting thing, you know, in the Sabarmati River estuary, the mixing of saline water of sea and the sweet water of Sabarmati, it can be distinctly found out from this uh, polarimetric data. And in fact, the research is the first polarimetry, you know, the, we did a cancer mode. There is a very wide swath mode polarimetry. The research was the first to pioneer. And research was to first to pioneer a spotlight mode. We improved it to sliding spotlight. It was taken, it is an actually an image. It could image almost 10 kilometer in cross direction and 100 kilometer. And you know why this number should surprise you? At that time, one of the best star we have procured from Israel is that could only image in a five by five kilometer. And this is the star in the C band spotlight star, the RI set or radar imaging satellite introduced for the first time in 2013, that the first time the operation was done. And you see that a uh, how widespread we could image. I mean, it, in fact, it became an, uh, one of the path-breaking standard for global SAR systems. One can see that they're very nice images. This uh, left side is the Moscow's Rubyansk Stadium. Right side, you can see the TCS tower in the Salt Lake. Each of the floors, you can see it separately. 
and uh, there are a type different images we did over China, Shanghai and all. I am not going into detail. And the most important, it gave rise to a number of innovations. We brought down, brought new concepts to patents for patent applied one, copyrights. We have developed different technologies. And we have developed industries as a co-partners for 11 industries we have developed. That is a high time. I still cherish that uh, NASA chief Charles Bolden. He took me aside in uh, in Washington D.C. and uh, in a meeting, and he told me that he wants to see the lab where one can build synthetic antenna uh, aperture radar at a, such a cheap cost. In fact, he took me aside and asked me, "Is this the cost you built?" I said, "Yes." That was one fifth of the cost what NASA is to build. And he promised to come down to the lab what he wants to see, where such a SAR can be built so cheap. It was a great honor coming from him. One of the very interesting things that a, this SAR, you know, if you would have seen this SAR being tested, you will see that a you will not see any uh, instrument to measure. You know, actually, the same radar was designed to test itself. In fact, the, we built a near field test facility, and they, it was the first time in the world we built a near field test facility by measuring the time differences. It's a time gated measurement, and we could build it in lab, and the whole SAR itself was the digitizer, it, it was the receiver and it could measure itself and only connection to the external world, world was to an optical fiber. We were, you know, a, a small amount of AC leakage would have burned the whole of the SAR system. That is why we had to take this precaution. Similarly, you know, we have, you can see that the, we found out that the calibration measurements antenna um, corrections and you can see that the left side what is the antenna calibration what we initially used and what we improvised and put it through a patent also how you can calibrate an active array antenna with a single transmission and and you can get a almost near rear and almost near almost near theoretical antenna pattern. And there was an interesting experience we done. That we wanted to see how good the resolution of the near field resolution. And uh, what we see that uh, we could did an interesting measurement. Just a minute. Just a minute. What is it there? Sorry, just a minute. <laughs> there is a noise. See, that a interesting measurement, what it has come, that a, how can you write a calligraphy and uh, find out the resolution? What we calculated, near field resolution, we calculated as a lambda by two, and we got almost a 0 0.7 lambda. We built new different technologies. That's a TR module. And they also, we built a power supplies, miniature power supplies with uh, ferrite transformers embedded in the PCB. In fact, the 16 layer PCB turns were used as a transformer turns. And also, we have built that a radar a near field measurement system. And I am very proud that we have made a laser guided antenna and printed uh, printing system. And we also built our own ASIC to control the 
Sir, in fact, I must tell you, this R has almost 3,000 subsystems, of which 576 were tier models and 314 were so the onboard computers. They were to work seamlessly. But the most pride we take that we revived the GetEc foundry in Hyderabad. In fact, uh, nobody used to believe that uh, we can build MMISs in the country. And uh, we have built not only that uh, sourced all the MMISs from the say, GetEc foundry, but also we used the same foundry to develop three processes, you know, namely switch processes, high power processes, and also the low noise amplifier processes. Another high point to the development of the Chandrajan 2 dual frequency SAR payload. It is, you know, there's a target was given to 11 kg and we built it with a 15.5. In fact, uh, sorry, the target was given with a 15 kg and we built it with a 15.5 kg. One must understand this is a dual frequency having both L and S band SAR in it. And you can see that the, how much we have imaged that both North Pole and South Pole. And we have improved upon the data of what a Chandrajan 1 could find out. Chandrajan 1 could detect the presence of water and the ice in the, in the Holes, but we could also assess the amount of water what is present by measuring the diff, uh, different depth penetration from in both L and S band. One can see that uh, very nice images of Chandrajan to radar. We have built one SAR, you know, in S band. Uh, with the resolution of one feet, you can, it is in weighing 5.5 kg and everything is outside, you know, in fact, it doesn't have any protective red or any other thing. And they, though the aircraft were to fly there, but it has in all the electronics are built behind this antenna. And it's a very small, sir, and you can see that uh, how sharp images you could capture around 50 kilometer away. Then this is a flying Ellen S band sir. Presently it is flying in the NASA aircraft over the North Pole. And they, this is also one of the small sir dual frequency sir we have built. And uh, you can see that the quality of polarimetric images, what we could get out of it. I'm not going into the details. And this is the high point of the reset 2B and reset 2B R1. This is an expand SAR we built with a very miniature as, but we did not use a TWTA. We used actually the first time we used gallium nitrate chips as the power sources and they a butler matrix to co combine them. In fact, there was a very interesting story. You know, this butler matrix, when the our electronics engineers designed, they designed in a flat, big piece, which could not be put. Finally, I had to tell uh, one third year architecture girl came to meet me uh, for completion of her training. And I, I gave with him, gave her the task to make it compact and only told that uh, what are the conditions in it, in it boundary conditions and you'll be surprised that the sieve made the first and probably the world's best compacted butler matrix it's a eight by eight butler matrix and it is no wonder that uh, many times we get locked into ideas by in our own way, but uh, from a, another content, uh, uh, sister subjects or the departments, you have a different expertise which can be harnessed to make a much better engineering. 
you can see that the uh, images what we got out of it. And uh, next year we are going to launch NASA, NASA ISRO sir. It is a sir, you know, which I am is a digital beam former base sir. That uh, L band sir will be built by JPL NASA. It has been built, and S band sir has been built by ISRO. And uh, these two SARs will actually give a measurement of Earth's surface every eight days, so that you can find out that difference in height variation by two millimeter. It is an extraordinary target. This will give you a, a warning to an impending volcano eruption or an impending earthquake or a crop growth or a ice cracking away in pole region or many, many things. Or, and we'll hope to predict earthquake, not in terms of one particular day, but probably in a time frame, so that the, you need not invest in any road building or a house building in those areas in a, in a shorter term. We give you an, one analysis of you know, how the Calcutta University area in Kolkata is gradually subsiding because of excess water extraction from the ground. This is an analysis is done with our data. And before finishing, I just like to tell you that uh, which frequency you should use for different thing. You know, uh, normally the uh, low, low wavelength or the high frequency signal they get reflected mostly from the top surface of canopies. As you increase the higher and the higher wavelength or the lower frequencies, they can penetrate to the canopy and take out the signature from the bottom. I'll tell you that a, an example of this, you know, this is the C-band SAR for the same area that in L-band. You see that how much extra energy information it has got. And the same area in the P band at the 460 megahertz. In fact, the multi frequency radar, you know, because uh, for type of foliage, the type of information we want, we need to have a different penetration capability. And this is what we need to use judiciously the frequency of operation depending upon where we operate. Another interesting thing is just look at these two images. You know, there is a lake which vanished in vertical polarization, but it appeared in the cross polarization. This is because of a wind blowing over water, which makes a capillary wave, and they make strong returns in the copolar regions, but a weak returns in the cross polar regions, and that is how you can. You know, that is, one has to select polarization for a particular applications. Similarly, if you can see that a, a delta, a, this a river, a Assam, Kajiranga region, how Brahmaputra inspect, how different polarization can pick up the spread differently. And one of the very good analysis we have done, you know, that's a, flooding because of in the Kajiranga because of excess rain. We have been monitoring that all the water reservoirs or ponds, how they are changing their coverage over the year through it is a very important information for the government for planning for drought. And this is how you can see that what are the water reservoirs getting dry in summer, but getting spread just at the end of the rainy season. You know, the, sometimes we image, you know, that's a, uh, what we image from the storm and all, you can see that the cloud from top. You really do not have an idea why, how much at all it has rained. You know, there might have been a big, cloud, but there may not be any rain. 
So there may be a thinner cloud, but there might have been rain. But what is interested for the crop farming, for agriculture, the amount of rain it has received ultimately on ground. And this is what a radar, our RI set radar could pick up uh, after the cyclone bio passed over Saurashtra region, how much area is actually it got rain. And this is a very clear signature of a, we get the rain soaked surfaces on earth. So we looked at the technology principle. We, te we looked at the development of, of the SAR technology in India. And we also looked at a sprinkle of ap applications, what we used it. Thank you very much for your patience and the floor is over to the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tapan, uh, for say, sharing uh, your insights on uh, SAR. Uh, so we would request the participants, uh, if there are any questions, uh, to address to Tapan, sir, and uh, we can go. Uh, sir, there are, there are a few questions coming up in the chat window, so probably we will read it out for you and you can answer uh, them for sure, us. Sure. Uh, Mr. Raju asks, what is the possibility of developing and using space-borne low frequency P-band around uh, 100 uh, megahertz frequency radar, such as foliage penetration radar or ice penetration radar? Okay. Uh, there are the two types of radar. You know, one is that the imaging surface and the other ground penetration. In fact, uh, in this case, the radar what is to be used. In fact, uh, the, this is the first radar what is used in Apollo 17. It is a one has to use a stick radar, stick antenna to transmit, and the, you re receive at a different depths. And they for different um, you know, you, when we image it, you have to image it as a multiple crossings. And they, from that, one can again uh, synthesize the aperture to create an image in the uh, cross section of vertical depth images. You have to get it to a synthetic aperture of multiple images. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is by uh, Pavitra Kumar. Uh, it says, what are uh, the typical power requirements of an airborne SAR and are there any limit, limit to uh, miniaturization? Is a typical you know, but the power requirements is around 2200 watts. It's, a, it's around 2200 watts is the DC power requirement and normally the pulse power is also around 20 watts. In fact, uh, usually the um, pulse ratios is of the order of 6 to 10 percent they are using. Sometimes they use a 20 percent but then the data rate goes up. So these are the typical power is used. It, it could image up to 100 kilometer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is by uh, Dr. Ganeshan, uh, which is, uh, how can we use SAR for weather predictions uh, and uh, fog smog propagation in any given area? Uh, what frequency is ideal for this? Yes, actually, that the uh, or it, SAR can be used to find out the soil moisture. I have given an example. In fact, this gives you and a heat transport mechanism. But for weather prediction, the basic driving force of the weather is the sea surface wind. You know, whether it's a rain, whether it is a heat, or whether it's a cold wave, it's all it can be measured from the sea surface. And in fact, uh, we have flown a, a cartel version of RISAT, except this antenna, Rest of the electronics, but in KU band, we call it a uh, alt, uh, this scatterometer radar. It's a low power radar. What is been flown, 
and uh, it could measure the ocean surface wind speed with direction. In fact, uh, that uh, you know, it, it, in fact, uh, if you look at it uh, that uh, today there is a big cyclones and you don't see any death. You know, the last big death was in the, the Orissa cyclone. After that, the cyclone hardly any death is there. Though any death, even a single death, is very painful to me. And this was possible because of the scatterometer prediction. Because the scatterometer measures the wind speed, and normally you see that there is a cyclone forms a vortex. Now the if there is a one side will be the low wind speed, other side will be the high wind speed. The high wind speed area will have a a low pressure and the low wind speed area will have a high pressure so it will move from if you look at a cyclone to move the prediction it is governed by that a resultant pressure gradient that direction it it moves and a, that is how that a today that a, it's a prediction has become so accurate it is only by almost a five to ten kilometer, that is why you see the last ten years after we launched this catrometer, there is the, uh, after we launched this uh, scatterometer, there is uh, hardly any death because we could predict the uh, landfall with a five to ten kilometer accuracy, and the government have to put a less effort. To move less number of people and cattle from that uh, landfall area. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you for a uh, very detailed response. Uh, the next question is from uh, uh, Kartike, uh, which says, uh, uh, "Do we have any terrestrial based and UAVs are being developed in India?" A terrestrial based, sir. And you. you You see, the terrestrial base SAR is used for survey of galactic region or the stars or the. So this for this actually, we have not built any capability till today. Is it okay? Answer. Yeah, yeah, thank you, sir. So I'm just like moderating the chat window for other question. Uh, thank you for that response. Uh, so, Mr. Prav uh, Prav uh, Pranav wants to know, can SAR be used for debris detection and tracking in space orbits? For? Debris detection and tracking in space orbits. Yes, SAR can be used. In fact, uh, but it will be called an inverse SAR. But uh, today's this is a very big active array the SARS are formed. In fact, we have one, you know, I was handling this job of a building MOT, a multi-object tracking radar, which with which we could track even a one meter object at a 800, uh, approximately 1000 kilometer away. But this we use for tracking our launchers as well as the debris. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Day wants to know what are the challenges and limitations of uh, SAR technology? Yes, the SAR technology, the challenges is to make it small. This is the one, you know, if you have to the high capability, then the power goes up. And the power goes up, then how to make it small? And then, then there is a challenge is coming in the digital beam format technology to make a seamlessly high resolution SAR instead of a spotlight SAR. These are the new challenges that are there. Furthermore, you know, how to make it cheap because today all said and done, you know, SAR technology, though in India it cost approximately one tenth of what you would need to build in US or any other country, but still it is a costing a lot. So if you want to make it a more usable, we have to make it a cost, we have to bring it down to very significantly. That means say we have to introduce a lot of miniaturization segments in that design. 
thank you thank you sir and uh, 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 we'll take a follow up question by dr ganeshan on the same lines and come back to the other questions uh, so dr ganeshan uh, wants to know how can indian academia and industry can help advance this technology further yes there are two aspects of technology one is that they bringing the data analytic that this sar data has a lot of information because this sar is a complete information because it it has a polarization it has a frequency it has a phase and it has amplitude you know these four informations are there and from that four information how to extract a, a appropriate ground analytic this is a challenge and because one need to understand you know the sar mechanisms imaging mechanisms to get a better idea of the analytic unlike cameras you know our eyes are heuristic the images correspond to our eyes so many of our heuristic understandings can be readily converted into algorithms but uh, in synthetic aperture radar images the, our heuristic understanding will not work it has to come with a specialized algorithm to extract different types of information so that is what academia can come there and academia will encourage them that they, uh, they use sar understanding of sar to develop medical instrumentation you know, surprisingly we are very poor for a made in india medical instrumentation right. Right. yeah so that uh, portion you, should come there uh, so the next question is from uh, mr mahadevan uh, who wants to know have you used sar for survey of mars mines can you can you be slightly louder have having used sar for survey of immersed mines you see it depends upon the how penetration can kind of. say i explained to you that the the penetration depends upon the frequency in fact the very ideal frequency is the l and p band which can penetrate through the ground and also it depends upon the surface dryness like you know we use sar to find out the lost tragic uh, track of the saraswati river in the uh, rajasthan desert you know this buried track we could found this is a possible because of uh, uh, very less moisture content in the um, uh, at the, on the surface we could also locate many of this um, you know limestone mines in rajasthan region but in other regions to find out the mines we need to use a very low frequency normally as a p band sar or an 100 megahertz band sar as a dr raju asked the question Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Karthikeyan, uh, who wants to know feasibility of UAV SAR and onboard mounting pods for SAR on UAV to attenuate the mechanical vibration reaching the SAR. You see that a UAV and aircraft, there are two problems. You know, there's a more the lower the height, or lower the flying object size, the atmospheric disturbances will be heavier. And the propeller driven aircraft vehicles, they will have a more noise and more. But it is not a problem as long as you capture the motion in a precisely. In fact, nowadays, you know, the uh, inertial navigation systems are available up to almost 1000 hertz bandwidth, which is enough for the propeller driven aircrafts or UAVs. And they also that a GPS aiding, which makes it at a INS very accurate, they have also come in a long way. 
but uh, many times the GPS aided INS, you know, they have a Kalman filter creates a, this is a fit forward Kalman filter corrections are there. They create a problem. You know, I prefer to use a post facto data, reprocess, bypass this Kalman filter and use a fast Fourier transformer based filters to make it a, a proper sharp rejections to mix both the signals because that there is a in a Kalman Kalman filter based filter there is a problem with the transition zone between a high pass filter and the low pass filter the data is inaccurate because there are the both the signals are getting mixed up so that they create problem so I personally prefer you know the post facto analysis with a uh, with a fast Fourier transform based filters, which are more accurate than the Kalman filters. So all the images you saw that are based on those sharp images are because of motion compensation using that sort of our own indigenous filters. Thank you, sir. As we are discussing on image processing, uh, there is another question from Dr. Ganeshan, uh, uh, who wants to know how much of SAR image processing can be done in real time and for full reconstruction of the images and stitching them. Okay. You see, SAR can be processed real time. But uh, there is in, you know, there is a very funny thing of the SAR. If you SAR, if you digitize on board, you can even with a uh, automatic gain correction, is, there is a compression methods where you can compress it into two bit and transmit it and you will get a still a very clear images in fact a, most of the images i have shown they were actually digitized with a three bit or four bit it is unbelievable because the correlation we get back to the complete energy but if you process on board the image dynamic range increases very heavily it goes to 16 bit in fact a processing on board is a not only costly in terms of hardware and power but it is costly in terms of data rate by a factor of 10. In fact, that is the reason that the most of the SAR is actually the raw data is transmitted in real time. In ground, it is processed because that makes it a both transmitter costly and uh, cheaper as well as the onboard hardware simpler and better. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, insight, uh, sir. Uh, uh, the next question is on uh, from Karthikeyan, who wants to know the scope of automation and autonomy in SAR-based technology. Yes, the, you see that a, for ease of imaging, that there is a, you know, there's a, it has to be steered along the normal direction but then you know they say for that a good amount of automation to be used and it should be that the stabilization system or the gimbal system should read out what is the aircraft or the flight disturbances and then correct the reverse correction on it but uh, all the airborne images what you saw you know we actually dispensed with the stabilization system you know there is no automation was not there Instead, we have mathematically stabilized the data on ground. What we saw to the so shown you there that a math a motion compensation, we have done the linear motions corrections and all. But a, what we have done also is stabilized on ground. That is a we call it a track steering. Instead of a steering the antenna. We mathematically track the steer. Let this antenna be looking anywhere. The mathematically computed uh, uh, the track perpendicular to the beam direction what we estimate and process it. In fact, we have gone one step further. This is also a patent by me, which showed that a, one can do a SAR, airborne SAR or a UAB SAR without a bulky stabilization system. Albeit stabilization system, it lessens the job, but then you know today computing costs are falling down very sharply. 
So one can dispense with costly stabilization systems there. Many people, you know, many of this uh, uh, supplier of aircraft uh, are, you know, they are not very confident of the motion compensation system. So they force you to buy a jet aircraft flying at a very high altitude where the motion disturbances are less. So the by increasing the cost by a factor of 10, but the, our SARS, you know, because we are in a, we are not very plus with funds. We are left with a aircraft which can fly at a low altitude and a, with a lot of disturbances, adverse disturbances. So we have to improvise on the processing to get rid of all the disturbances. In fact, that way we have gone one step further and we could operate with a very cheaper aircraft or a cheaper UAV. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, answering all of our uh, questions from our participants uh, with utmost clarity. Uh, so we, uh, uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat window. Uh, and again, on behalf of ITPALI, Comsoc, ITPALI, uh, APMTT Joint Chapter Bangalore section, uh, we would like to express our deep sense of gratitude uh, to you uh, for gracing this occasion and uh, sharing your thought-provoking and interesting address on SAR. I would now uh, hand over the virtual podium back to uh, Dr. Alok for closing remarks. Sir. So thank you, thank you very much. And uh, possibly we could take a photo after this. Uh, this is the last event of the year. So as you get set, uh, let me. Just thank you again for accepting the invite, Tapan, and uh, for wonderful presentations. Uh, your whole 35 years worth of work, putting it very pictorially, and uh, thoughts are very clearly coming out, so you could grasp it uh, quite a bit of it. And you brought it, you know, my presentations of, you know, mechanical sc uh, scanning and the high power. TWT, Klystrons, and how things have changed, the active antenna arrays, the electronic steering, the digital beam forming that you talked about. So this is fantastic, but you also brought in some of the failures on the way, you know, pressure changes in the aircraft and the corona discharge and multiple rounds of it to get even a simple things right. So I think that's also part of the people's learning that, you know, you have to persevere and continue into that. You brought in, you know, how academia could play a role. Uh, Gatec foundry being used, uh, you know, MMIC is coming up, uh, you know, and the ASICs designs in the country, how NASA came and one fifth of the cost they re-verified. Is it really true? So this is, uh, a lot of interesting thing how you change the power source to gallium nitride, different applications. You're advising on how SAR data, you know, since it brings multiple amplitude, frequency, phase, many of those data that are available, somebody knowing that and bringing them together for an analytics uh, would be very, very helpful as a next step. Also, the processing onboard versus you know offline uh, you know the differences so it has been a very fantastic learning and i really sincerely thank you on behalf of ieee bangalore sections comsoc apmtt and all of our comsoc execom members thank you and uh, you know we'd love to take a photo if others are also opening their cameras if you would like to be part of it yes and kindly pass on the photo to me will be very nice sure. and uh, it is such a pleasure to talk to people and I got so many questions, interesting questions which slightly baffled me but I could answer I hopefully properly and the subject is I hope and we also have the people that have not joined but many of them through the YouTube channel so Bangalore Comsoc has a YouTube channel so we'll post it and I'm sure Subsequently, we'll have more views and we'll keep you posted. So anyone else that wants to open the camera, please do so and we take a click. Chengappa, you are going to.
Yeah, yeah, I have uh, taken, sir. Okay. You take it? Fine. Yep, yep. I'll type okay. Dr. Alok was giving the closing remarks. I did capture some. So thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for your patience and uh, hearing. And wish you Merry Christmas and Happy New Year as it comes. Thank you thank all. Thank you all very much for your all the patience for listening to it. Hopefully I could convey all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you all of for the very nice evening. Only in between I had to rush forward so you can delete that thing. <laughs> Thank you, Dabar. Uh, okay. Thank you. I, Mahadevan, I would like to inform the way the way he worked for RISAT to make the testing. See, people don't concentrate much on testing, but the amount of effort he put to get the RISAT uh, payload tested was so fantastic. And each and every aspect, especially the laser tracking system, the near field system, and also to track which of the elements which are there. There are so many elements in that, each one having its uh, own DR modules. And so uh, to even track the wrong ones, as he showed in one of his photographs, well, in one scan, you can find out if there is any problem. And if there is a problem, you can immediately set that right at the ground. So that uh, if it, it may file uh, after it goes up, but uh, on the ground, you are absolutely sure that everything is done. and they, whole place was so very well transformed into a very high tech uh, uh, micro lab, which was done by him. So yeah, everything is still very green in our mind, even though it's more than a decade. So the, the, the setup which he did for this uh, is something absolutely amazing. So I thought I would start with this August gathering, which was very yeah, thank you. closely thank associated you, Dr. during our SARA SAR. So I'm a past chair of the I MTT here in Bangalore, and I was in Israel earlier. Great, great. Good to hear. Great, thank you. Sir. I also thank see you. my good friend uh, Sandar Rajan. Yeah. Great. And I think thank you, thank Dr. you very also, much. Who was a uh, one of the main person who was working in this area? <laughs> Dr. Raju, want to say something? Yeah, I would like to. Uh, share similar thing what Dr. Day had with uh, Tapan, same experience. We were the same flat mates. We were in the same building in Ahmedabad. And I had also the opportunity to fly together in the first slot, as well as the first synthetic aperture radar, which we flew Great. over run of catch. Thank you all. I, I happily remember that kind of uh, early interaction. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you. Very good to hear. Thank you. Thank you again. And take care. Stay Thank healthy. Care. Stay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. And until we meet again, stay safe.